Well, you've seen it before, but um, you know this is uh, this is an iconic image of the of the comet, and um, I mean it, it was a, a bit of an oh my goodness moment when we actually saw that. I'm not quite sure that's what we exactly said, but um, um, and, and an interesting thing about this is uh, I, I spent uh, about a year of my life. Um, what we were doing is we were kind of trying to work out how we would actually ultimately land on this comet. Of course, we hadn't seen it by then, so. We were relying on a, a, a nice publication from my colleague Simon Green, who'd uh, in 2012 published the shape model of the comet. And it was going to be just like a lovely potato. And uh, so all the planning that went into to how we would land on this thing was all done with a shape model. So when we saw the real thing, we had to tear all that up and, and actually start again. Um, uh, very complex shape. Uh, in a way, uh, it was unexpected, but I think if we do more cometary uh, missions and so on, I mean, nothing will be uh, unexpected. Um, one thing I'd like to draw attention to in, in this image is the, is the circular dark uh, area at the end there, because that is actually the, uh, the, the region in which we actually uh, um, landed. Now, um, both Colin and uh, Simon, are, are what you might call proper cometary scientists. I mean, what they do is they study comets and minor bodies, and they're absolute experts in all aspects of them. Uh, in that sense, I, I, I'm not a cometary scientist. What I'm interested in is the chemistry, the chemical composition of the solar system. How did things come together to form planets like our own? And that's of particular uh, interest. I mean, it's a, it's a lovely place, isn't it? I mean, I think uh, no matter what your culture or religion is, you can look at that and think that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic place. How did, how did that form? Um, uh, given that, you know, if, if you went back four and a half billion years, that's actually what it looked like. I mean, it, it was hell. We call this period of time the, the Hadean period because uh, it, it was like hell. There's no way there could be any life on that planet. So somehow or other, we went from this to the, 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 the kind of world that we see now. And the thing is, you can't study that directly from looking at the Earth, because clearly everything got melted, got heated up, got reset. And so there's a sort of period of half a billion years or so where you can't really see back through it as to what was going on. So if you want to understand what was going on at that point, you've got to look at these other bits and pieces from around the solar system. And, and comets are, are one such example of that sort of detritus that you can um, study up close and then basically look back in time to this era and work out what, uh, what was going on. So that provides the driver for my interest in, 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 in the mission. I mean, ultimately, what, you, what you're thinking is, well, at some point we went from that Hadean world to, to one which had started to quieten down a bit. Uh, water was accumulating on the surface, an atmosphere was growing. And, and clearly, uh, life formed. I mean, the fact that we're here just, you know, uh, exemplifies the fact that life got started somehow or other. So clearly, we want to understand that, that kind of uh, hidden period in, in Earth's history that we can't see by studying the Earth itself. And we're looking to study the comets um, to, to, to fill the gaps there. And uh, if, if we get into what's been happening uh, with the cometary investigations themselves, this is, the, these are data from a, an instrument that's on the orbiter part of uh, Rosetta. This is an instrument called Rosina. It is a mass spectrometer. And what this is doing is it's measuring all kinds of different uh, chemicals and whatever else uh, it can see within the coma. And um, what you can see plotted here are variations in carbon dioxide to, to water ratio. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is this is looking at this body from afar. And they're kind of having to use a lot of judgment about um, what they see from afar. How does it relate to what they can see on the surface? Uh, what we want to do is actually get down onto the surface uh, into at least one position and actually get a proper uh, detailed measurement of, uh, of the ground itself. And then it'll be possible to sort of cross-calibrate these, um, these data sets. Now, in terms of what we were doing... Um, as we approached the comet, we, we woke up earlier last year, the start of last year, uh, did a load of post-hibernation commissioning in about April time, started running our instrument and, uh, and, and getting data. And then, as you can see, as we started to get closer and closer to the comet there, we, with distances of 30 and 20 and 10 kilometers, we were running up the instrument and, uh, and, and seeing what we could see. And we can see some variations there. Even though our instrument is designed to actually work on the ground, we were actually using it uh, as we approached. I mean, in some ways, to practice how to use the instrument. Um, 
uh, and make sure it was working properly, but in other ways to actually get some uh, scientific data. In fact, it was a bit of an insurance policy, knowing that the landing itself was going to be quite, uh, quite a difficult business. Anyway, this is, uh, this is how, it, how it looked on the day. Um, this was uh, this, this is the descent of Philae. And all these uh, uh, images and so on that you're seeing here, they're all available on, uh, on an ESA website. And uh, this particular one has an, an, an animated GIF in it, and you can watch the lander rotate as you go down. So anyone who's interested, surely uh, follow that stuff up. It's great. Um, I mean, we didn't see that on the day. That's what it looked like uh, after it's all been uh, stitched back together. That's actually what it looked like on the day. Uh, these are some of the principal investigators uh, at ESOC. We had a special room uh, for us to go and, uh, and hide. And uh, what you can see on the screen there is, that is the first image that they've seen from uh, using the camera. And they've seen this uh, lander going down. This is, the, this is during the landing. And uh, you can see the guys with their smartphones there. It was like some celebrity had arrived, you know, and uh, uh, tremendous excitement at, at that point. Uh, Simon's already shown this image. It's another iconic one. Um, what I would point out is that you can see there at, uh, at, at 18 minutes past three, that's actually universal time, uh, but that's when the champagne was opened and, and drunk in, uh, in, at the control centre in ESOC, which is where I was. Um, for Geraint, who was actually in, in Cologne at the time, you know, doing some proper work, um, the champagne was put away because those guys could see straight away that this thing hadn't landed. Um, and so uh, there was an interesting uh, period of time there when it wasn't sure, weren't sure what was actually going to happen. Um, there's that circular feature. You could just see it there uh, that, that I showed before. And the red arrow there shows the, the kind of trajectory that, that, that we had as we were coming down. <coughs> it, it's not actually, we're actually coming down vertically, if you like. But, of course, the comet is rotating. So um, we, we hit the ground and didn't anchor, as Simon says, and, and bounced back off again. And may well have bounced all the way off and never seen the comet ever again but clearly it it, it, it has landed into that uh, into that ellipt elliptical area there again Simon's um, shown this this image um, this area is called Abydos now it has an actual name and uh, I can report that the Osiris uh, team have found the lander uh, in fact they've found it many different times in many different places <laughs> and and the reason is that the signals they're looking for uh, are very easily confused with uh, with boulders and so they've tried their hardest, and they still haven't found it yet. But to, to, to illustrate that, that, that ellipse is about 300 metres long. It's not, a, it's not a big place. It's not like when we had to look for Beagle, you know, looking at the soul of, uh, of Mars. You're, you're actually looking at quite a small area. You still can't find it. It's very difficult. Simon showed this image, um, but actually um, he showed it in the orientation that it was um, publicised at the time. And, of course, it was, it was kind of configured to be the way it was expected to be. It's quite obvious as we're beginning to look at it that actually this is on its side. So I've, I've rotated that, and as Simon pointed out, the sky's pointing upwards. And uh, for me, to try and understand what this actually looked like, if you imagine one of these kind of bowl-shaped chairs, I mean, that's what we're like, uh, the, the box there on its side with the three legs um, uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, and it basically came to rest uh, uh, in that. Uh, and that's a more official version from the uh, operations people on a... On a on the kind of terrain that they think they've modelled. And uh, I think this is one done by the amateurs. But again, it shows you, it, it gives you the impression that we're kind of on our side. And so interestingly, we can, using the cameras, instead of seeing um, a panorama, what we're seeing is we're seeing um, the bowl shape that, that we're in and just one camera pointing out to the sky. The other thing is, I think you can aware, we're hoping to actually make measurements of samples by drilling down into the surface. But unfortunately, we're on our side and the cliff that we're trying to drill into is too far away. So um, there's still some things to work out there as to, as to what we might do if we, uh, if we wake up. Um, just to, just to um, say that, uh, absolutely curiously, that, that in that image I showed before, at that particular time there, 1543, we were actually uh, running our instrument and actually collecting data at that particular point. And what I've shown here is the, it's just a collection of the number of uh, experiments that we actually did um, during this period. So you can see all the numbers of different mass spectra we've got there. Lots of nice data in the can. People say, hey, Ian, you're going to show us some data. It's like, yeah, they go. Uh, now, see, the problem is that um, to the non-aficionados, it can look a bit dull. It's not like these lovely images and so on. This is a mass spectrum. 
Um, the intensity is the, is the height of the peaks, and the mass is the, is the distance across there. And so our job is to try and understand through mass calibration and whatever else exactly what is in these mass, mass spectra. And because we actually ended up operating in what you might call non-optimal conditions, um, we've had to spend quite a bit of time actually trying to uh, reconstruct some of these. So we've got loads of data, and we're still working on the interpretations, but we're really, really pleased um, the data are, are, are really interesting, and we've come up with some interesting ideas. As Simon says, you know, for in the publishing world, we have to, we're not allowed to talk about those until such time as it's actually in, in press. And uh, so basically that's what we built. That's what we built uh, here at the Open University in partnership with the Rutherford Appleton Lab. Um, it's an instrument called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer that would occupy, if it was in the lab and it was, a, you know, one use in the lab, it, is, it would something be the size of a couple of office desks to put that into context. You can see the hand there. Um, this is a sort of uh, device, so we say the size of a shoebox. And that is actually sitting on the comet now and has actually already performed. And what Geraint is going to talk about, he's also known as TAF, and he's quite happy to be called TAF because he's Welsh. Um, he's, go he's going to tell us about uh, all the things that uh, he was able to do uh, using the know-how that we developed on this project, which was basically about miniaturising things and coming up with our, you know, novel analytical techniques and so on. I'll hand over to Taff. 